Welcome every, everyone to the Modern Dental Pacific Digital Webinar. Um, I just want to make a quick wel welcome to um, Dr. Simon Parsons and Matt Smith who will be here to answer any questions. So Dr. Simon Parsons will be doing the presenting. Um, we're having a few problems with sound. Um, you need to connect via a laptop or mobile. The app doesn't appear to be working. So um, use the chat bar if you're having any problems um, and we'll try and work that out. But we'll get going with the webinar. Well, good, good evening, everyone, and thank you for spending the time to join us uh, this evening for this session. We're going to run until around 7.30. I do encourage you to ask any questions via the chat bar as they arise in your mind. What we've tried to do between Matt and myself is to put together a presentation about um, digital dentistry with a focus on intraoral scanners. And we've targeted this for people who, as a rule, are not really familiar with the whole concept of how to use and choose a scanner for their practice. So the bulk of this evening's presentation is going to focus on looking at that through really three lenses, one of which is what are the benefits of going digital as far as your uh, laboratory related procedures go? And then assuming that you can see the benefits for you and your own practice, how are you going to choose the right scanner to meet your needs? And then once you've chosen that scanner, how are you going to get the most out of it? How are you going to implement it in order to really make it work for you and the rest of your team? So let's have a look first of all at why you should at least partly consider going digital. And if you think about it, really, you've gone digital in many areas of your practice. And I'd imagine that most of you by now uh, have dispensed with the old film-based technologies that we use for intraoral radiography. You probably have digital camera uh, facilities within your practice. And the vast majority of you use electronic uh, patient management systems within your practice and you wouldn't really dream about going and using a paper-based appointment book anymore. So really, intraoral scanning is the next step to take your practice to. And we accept the fact that often it's not good to adopt technology too early on in the life cycle of the technology. And sometimes the technology can be expensive and we're really quite reluctant to embrace change until we have to. Or perhaps you're used to taking impressions the old way, the, the conventional way, and that it works well in your hands. So why would you want to change? And we acknowledge all of those issues. Um, some people are concerned, though, that as technology changes, they may spend a lot of money on technology to find that it actually 
uh, becomes obsolescent before they've really mastered it. Um, or perhaps you work in a practice where uh, you don't get to call the shots as to what is purchased. But by all means, have a think about, well, would you ever really want to go back to the old ways? And are you willing to try something new? And some of you are doing photography uh, in your practice using digital cameras. Uh, you may be doing some digital smile design and uh, you may have cone beam. And so really the, the next two issues are, well, are you ready for digital impressions? And if necessary also, do you want to do your own milling within your own practice? And I think it is true to say that uh, digital in dentistry has really become more of an enabler rather than a hindrance. It's really opened up a wealth of opportunities. And it's certainly our belief here at Modern Dental and uh, that, that you can create new opportunities with your patients. We'll be spending a little bit of time tonight just talking about what those opportunities may be. I think though it's fair to acknowledge that really digital won't change your dentistry unless you were to learn and improve with your dentistry because a bad preparation will always still be a bad preparation and if anything digital is going to show you that on a big screen and remind you that you need to improve in how you finish your preps. Uh, digital can only see what you can see so if you don't do good retraction your scanner's only going to see what you're seeing in the mouth. Uh, some people have concerns about the accuracy of intraoral scanners. We will spend some time looking at some data about that. They can be hard to use towards the back of the mouth. They are relatively expensive. You'll see some indicative pricing although it's from the US uh, on a slide going forwards. There's limitations for its application in uh, removable prosthodontics because you can't really do mucocompressive loading with them at this point in time. And it's difficult to indicate in your intraoral scan where the reflection of the soft tissues needs to be. So what will be the depth of the sulcus? Uh, you do need to keep an inventory of certain parts. We do understand that um, you know, you're not going to drop 40,000 on a device and then leave it in the cupboard, so it has to be accessible for you and in order for it to pay for itself. And you really need to ask questions such as, do I want to scan and mill or should I just be scanning and sending my scans to uh, a lab? And as some of you have found even connecting to this webinar tonight, you need some IT skills sometimes throughout your life. So if IT isn't your thing, then perhaps scanning isn't yet really going to be your thing, at least for the next year or two until things are simplified a little bit more. But having said that, the literature certainly tells us from some recent aggregation studies that there's a whole lot of advantages in scanning. And a lot of them relate to the patient and the fact that patients really prefer scanning uh, to having conventional impressions taken the vast majority of the time. There's evidence to say that scanning is faster than taking conventional impressions that the whole setup and clean up and the sorts of systems that you need to use in doing digital impressions is much easier and, and simpler than setting up a whole lot of devices within the surgery. There's no need to pour plastic casts and trim them and package them. Uh, you can communicate in real time with your technician if you want to and certainly your patients appreciate what you're doing for them and can see and take a great deal of interest in what you do with them. Having said that, as I said earlier, you know, if you've got really deep subgingival preps or if you're doing a lot of dentures and other aspects where it's not easy for a scanner to work, then there are real disadvantages in the current technology. And it takes a while to master this technology and you're going to have to pay for it. Some other benefits though are that your jobs get turned around faster, they're less likely to be mixed up and bagged with the uh, wrong patient name on them. Models don't get broken or chipped in transit this way because you're not sending models. You can delegate some of the duties to the team. And by that, we say that some practices, and we don't advocate one way or the other, but some practices might like to use the scanners, have their support staff take shades as a preliminary shade or do a preliminary scan in the mouth to then be modified by the dentist and refined by the dentist. There's opportunities to really tap into the patient's of interest about case acceptance and really show them what's possible. And there's plenty of evidence in the literature now to say that because scanners show you the flaws in your preparation, the amount of occlusal reduction you've provided, uh, things of that nature in real time as you finish 
your preparation and scanned it, then it's less likely that you're going to get it wrong or get knocked back by the lab who then have to contact you and say, you don't provide us with enough room here to make this particular restoration to your specifications. If you've ever had a, a dental assistant get a little bit of bite registration or impression material that's nowhere near enough to do your impression, then they have to swap over in the, in the gun halfway through doing your impression, or well, they haven't bled the, the imprint gun properly and it's not missing properly, then you know, as I do, that running out of materials halfway or having the wrong material can drive you nuts and you're not going to face that with your scanner unless you have a power outage or the NBN or your other means of uploading that the data goes down. And the nice thing though is that although you can uh, fix up minor errors quite easily and you don't need a whole lot of material then to, to take fix up one little spot on an impression, we'll talk about how to do that later, um, and it really is easy, it will only take what you give it. So um, if you don't put good work in, well, it's only going to show up the flaws as I said. What this means though, in reality, is that you can be faster and more efficient in your clinical practice with a scanner. You're gonna get your crowns and um, bridges and, and other fixed prosthodontics back faster, uh, including things like splints, because you're not paying and allowing for couriers to get jobs to the lab, having to get things poured up. That's available in real time uh, as soon as it's been uploaded to the lab. Um, as I said, you're, you're going to get better fit overall with your devices by and large. Probably going to save some money along the way unless your leasing costs or purchase costs on the scanner outweigh those savings, but certainly the amount of uh, materials you're buying for your lab and the amount of alginate and PVS or uh, polyether materials will certainly go down a lot, which are expensive. The number of trays that you're buying will be seriously diminished. Um, but, you know, there will be some things you'll still need to take conventional impressions for and things like taking a quick mouth guard impression or a, a quick retainer, although that can be done with a scan, probably still faster taking a quick alginate. I think you'll probably increase your caseload acceptance from your patients because they will be impressed by the level of technology that you have in your practice and the sorts of things you can offer them. Um, you'll learn where your deficiencies are in your clinical practice and you'll work on them. I think uh, Simon's on mute, guys.
your particular brand of scanner or is it going to be quite difficult to do. You want a small head with a scanner. The smaller, the better. I liken it in many ways to trying to buy elevators if you do any oral surgery. You need elevators that can get between teeth to loosen them. If they're too chunky, you can't use them. Will your scanner need for you to first spray uh, the prepared teeth and the opposing teeth with a powder or not? Because that can be a bit of a nuisance if it does. How long will it take you to scan? Does it capture it easily or do you have to go over the same area three or four times? Can you get a good deal on them so that, uh, you know, if you do a reasonable volume of work, uh, one of the laboratories or one of the scanner companies actually pay towards the cost of the lease because that is possible over here to do that. And I believe it may be possible in New Zealand too. And what's it going to cost you for the, the heads for the scanners? Because some of them are, are reusable, some of them are disposable, some of them will wear out after you autoclave or cold disinfect them a certain number of times. What sort of licensing cost do you need to pay to keep your software up to date and allow you to use it? Because many brands require you to pay a license fee. And will you produce accurate fit for your work? Because if you might be able to do a great scan and find that none of the work fits. So in that case, that's a bit of a disaster. This slide just shows you the sorts of areas where you can use a scanner and some really interesting technologies such as assessing and monitoring tooth wear. The, the software is allowing you to do that on things like the Trios now and also on ITRO. Some scanners allow you to take quite an accurate shade measurement and some of them allow you to take uh, high definition photographs so that you can upload those to the lab and uh, give them ideas about the characterization of the surface of adjacent teeth. And that can save you then picking up the digital SLR and having to upload photos from that. Um, certainly splints, uh, digital splints are possible and retainers that way. You can do a full mouth scan and use that as like a, a full color charting of your patient and use that to discuss with them what you see in their mouth, any ditch margins of restorations, caries. Some of these give you such good resolution, you can virtually immediately throw away your normal intraoral cameras. But as I said earlier, using it for removable pros is a, a, a pretty difficult thing to do with any high degree of certainty. And at this stage, it's my belief at least that I wouldn't go down that path for your dentures. But so where can you use it? Well, this slide shows uh, some more detail and uh, things such as guided implant surgery and a lot of custom made devices are possible that way. But we don't tend to recommend full arch reconstructions with scanners and that's because there is a slight variation in the accuracy of scanners doing the, the full arch and it is generally accepted in the literature from the studies that I've seen that uh, a PVS or polyether full arch impression is going to be slightly more accurate in those situations than what a current intraoral scan is going to be. So you need to decide what is it that your workflow is and what you need to support that by your choice of scanner and accept the fact that you may not better you do everything with the scanner. So if you're doing mainly crown and bridge work, you can buy virtually any scanner. And if you're doing three or four unit sorts of uh, bridges or single crowns or multiple veneers, uh, virtually any scanner is going to give you a really good uh, result with that. So what you want then is to get a scanner that you like to use. If you're doing a lot of implant work, then uh, some scanner brands have a lot of bundled software that allows you to design your implant and, uh, and also design a surgical guide to merge cone beam scans into the, the implant software and basically take control of how this implant is going to go. Now you can delegate that or you can do it yourself. And certainly things like uh, Three Shape Trios allows you to do that through their implant studio. Uh, other companies don't have that technology available at this stage. If you're doing a lot of implant work, it has to fit. There's no wriggle room with implants, as we all know. So you probably want scanners that provide you with higher accuracy than ones that don't. So that you have fewer problems with remakes uh, should a problem arise. If you're doing a lot of ortho, then there are some scanners, as I said, that liaise very quickly and easily with uh, companies like Invisalign, so you may prefer to use a scanner that does that than have more steps to follow using a different brand. Um, and certainly the ITRO is very good for doing a simplified case simulation of what teeth might look like if a patient was to have Invisalign and they can do that within a couple of minutes quite easily 
And that's a, a really handy tool if you're doing initial consers for people and you, you can't yet do a, a clean check. Uh, the downside with things like ITERO is that it doesn't really give you a, a, a life, uh, an accurate color representation of what all the tissues are in the mouth, uh, where some other brands do. So that brings us, I guess, to the question, well, okay, what features do I really need to consider then? And uh, besides what we've talked about already, I think what you really want to do is seek the scanner that has a tick or at least matches most of your criteria that way. And you want scanners that offer you both true results and precise results. I'll explain to you what I mean by that in the next few slides. Ideally, it has to have a high resolution. It's better if you don't need to use powder because there's simplified cleanup. Patients don't like powder being sprayed in their mouths as a general rule. And it's another thing that you've got to keep stock of if you need to use powder. You want to better scan quickly because time savings are valuable for you. As I said before, you need a small head, preferably one that can be reused after autoclaving. If you have full color images, they all, all the brands that offer full color images allow you to go into a monochrome image if you prefer. Uh, to remove distractions, but generally full color images are better for case presentations and look more lifelike as a result. And you want files that can be exported from your scanner that can be read by any lab. If they're locked down or you have to pay a fee to basically unlock them for labs to use, then that's going to cost you time and hassle and, and money, and you don't want to have to do that. So they're the broad criteria that you're going to really want to try to get ticks and get positives in ideally all of them, but if not all, then the vast majority of them. And some scanners allow you to do that better than others. And we'll look at that shortly. Well, what do I mean by accuracy, trueness, and precision? Well, when you look at this little uh, diagram, what you're trying to do is get into that top right-hand uh, sphere where you're getting reliable results more often than not and all your results tend to be similar to one another. So if you do that, then you're getting good precision and you're getting good trueness. So trueness is really overall how accurate it is to what it should be like in real life. And then the precision is how often that occurs, how reliably are you going to get that result? If it's all scattered like in the lower uh, left-hand one where you're a little bit off the mark and some are more off the mark than others, then you're not going to get reliable fit. And that's a real problem. If they're all off by 20 microns and it's 20 microns bigger, we can adjust that in the lab. But if it's not and you don't know that, then it's a real problem and there's too much error. So I guess one way of looking at that is, are you going to have a scanner that gives you a, a fit to within 100 microns and preferably a whole lot better than that time and time again? If you can, then you can rely on good results coming back from your lab. I put up this slide because I feel that we all know what McDonald's tastes like and it's very precise. They actually try to give you the same thing at every McDonald's virtually around the world. Unless you go to Japan, they have a few interesting different things. And Malaysia has a few different interesting things. So parts of Asia vary the menu, but a lot of McDonald's give you McDonald's. A Big Mac's a Big Mac. A Sunday is a Sunday. It's very precise. But I suppose if you're anything like me, I don't really like McDonald's burgers. I'd rather go to something like Grilled, um, where you get a much tastier burger, but it's a bit more expensive. Not all of you will like that. So the burger on the right is much truer to what a burger should taste like. But the problem may be that sometimes the egg is off to one side. Uh, there's two bits of tomato, whereas other times you get one. So sometimes those don't have a lot of precision in what's been done, but they're truer. So what you want is a burger that combines both. You want it to taste good like a real burger should and dribble right down to your arms as you're eating it. But at the same time, you want it to be like that every time you go out for a burger. And the same thing happens when you take a scan. So I managed to find this nice chart it's from a, a website in the US. So the pricing is US web uh, pricing from what I can gather. But these are arguably the six main brands of scanners on the market around the world. The Strauman one is the Dental Wings uh, scanner that some of you may or may not have heard of. And this chart really summarizes a lot of those features and how the different scanners stack up. And what you see is that they do vary according to these people somewhat in how easy they are to use, first of all, which is often your, your most important criteria because it's not easy, you won't use it. 
And that's based partly on the size of the, the head and how heavy it is and how heavy this wand is because heavy devices are tiring and more difficult to hold comfortably as you move them around the mouth and they're harder to get right up to the sevens and the eights. You want a scanner that ideally has high accuracy and as you can see in this chart, they vary. They vary a lot. I'm going to show you some more data on that shortly. Uh, just about all of them don't require powder, although the 3M1 really does for just about everything. Not all of them give you colour images. Uh, some of them can use gesture control. To be fair, the uh, Straumann Cares one has gesture control, like on some fancy cars these days in the infotainment. Uh, others don't. That's great for infection control. Somebody can just point the wand at the screen and it will work. Some of them are wireless. Three Shape have a wireless one. Others are cabled otherwise. Just about all of them are cabled. Uh, some are optimised, like Itero for Invisalign, because Invisalign, the company that owns Invisalign, also owns Itero. So it's in their business interest to provide good access to uh, their full value chain. Uh, partials are really hard to do, but some of them don't even offer the software to, uh, to allow you to do a, a partial denture scan. Varies in the type of sterilisation you do on the tips, the licensing and subscription fees, and overall then really what is it that you like and generally there are a few standout scanners in that list and probably the most popular ones are the Trios, the Itero and the CareStream. Uh, some people like the 3M one as well. Uh, 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 historically a very popular system tending to become less popular with time, uh, but still have quite good market penetration here in the Asia Pacific. So which one are you going to then select? It's going to be pretty much based on what you're going to spend, uh, what your preferences are from those lists, um, your service mix overall, whether you've got good support in your market. If you're in a rural area or uh, in some parts of New Zealand, it's going to be hard to get access to support when you need it. And you do need support to troubleshoot these at times, otherwise you'll have an expensive bit of technology collecting, collecting dust. And you need to decide, are you going to want to have a fully integrated solution where you uh, scan a mill or not? So there's some of the issues that you're going to be facing as you go. I've just got a couple of very quick slides to talk to you about a very recent study about how different scanners stack up for accuracy. Because if, you're, if you like technology like I do, but you also want your crowns and bridges to fit well, then you want to have a scanner that really provides accurate results. So this particular study, they actually had a resin die, which you can see on that uh, picture on the left, and they scanned it with an industrial grade scanner that we use as like a laboratory based scanner. And that's the scan of that die that has been achieved that way. And what we've got now on the next slide are a lot of different brands of scanners. The 3M scanners, the top middle, the CareStream ones are the next couple, the CS3500 and CS3600, the Dental Wings one, which is the Straumann, the Seric Omnicam, Plan Mecha Plan Scan, Trios, and then the bottom right hand one is an Impregum impression that has been poured and then scanned. And the screen on the right just shows the little areas that are actually where there are subgingival margins which are in these two areas here. So it's a close up of how well do these scanners record margins that are subgingival. And it shows also the level of detail of the triangulation that is part of the tessellated scanning technology that is used. And once you start to look at those close up images, you realize that they record images somewhat differently. And if your screen has enough resolution, you'll see that this particular one down here on the lower left is relatively blurry. The Trios one, by comparison, has a lot more detail, as do the CareStream ones. And sorry, it's a bit laggy on my mouse here. That's a CareStream one there. And it certainly looks somewhat similar, those to our master scan. So what's the take home message? Well, when you start to look at, well, how much discrepancy are you getting with these? The image on the on the right hand part of the screen, wherever you see red or yellow, the yellow is coming up towards 50 micron discrepancy and the red is in the region of around 100. So certain brands have a lot more discrepancy and a lot more risk of marginal misfit than others. And things like the Plan Mecha Plan Scan 
uh, is well into that sort of 100 micron, and it's either too big or too small, and that's going to vary what colour is showing there. So some tend to give you effectively a scan that represents the tooth as being too small. Others make it look as if it's too big. Some are a mixture of both, in which case it's hard for the lab to adjust um, in the software to accommodate the discrepancies in your scan. So it's my belief, at least, that you want uh, to choose a scanner that tends to provide you with the most accurate scanning as well as good user friendliness. But the, the most accurate scanners from this uh, recent study seems to be TRIOS and CareStream uh, by some margin compared to some of these other uh, scanners. So uh, all of them struggle a little bit with subgingival margins, but certainly the TRIOS and the CareStream did far better than the other brands with uh, those subgingival areas to the extent that they're actually more accurate than this laboratory scan of the Impregum impression, which means to say that if you're worried about will it be as accurate for a single crown as a normal impression, the answer is, depending upon the scanner, yes, it will. It may actually be more accurate if you bought a good scanner that provides accurate results. So are they as good as conventional impressions? Well, 2016 study I've listed there certainly says that they exhibit very similar marginal misfit, whether you go digital or conventional. And for things like bridges, other studies suggest that too. And you actually save time compared to trying to syringe material, light body material around and trying to keep things dry uh, compared to just scanning uh, part of an arch. We do know that uh, bridges overall made in CAD, CAD CAM based on your scan, if you're Getting, say, a zirconia bridge done, the fit of that is going to be as good or better, typically, as if you did a conventional impression for your bridge work. So there's no real reason to be concerned anymore that fit is going to be an issue with your scanners, unlike the sort of CEREC machines from 20 years ago. But having said that, a poor preparation and a poor scan will still be a poor preparation and a poor scan, and these images just help to show you what we sometimes receive at the lab um, and they're certainly less than ideal preparations and they haven't always been dried very well and it's very difficult to read margins. The preps themselves are quite rough and uh, the around, surrounding teeth are poorly recorded, contact points are poorly recorded and it means that it doesn't matter if you've got $50,000 worth of technology it's only going to show you your inadequacies unless you get this right and dry teeth off and we retract gingival margins well. And this image also shows you that you can take a, actually a, a moderately decent, although not by no means ideal, scan of a prepared tooth, but still not trim your scan well enough. So where I've got the arrows showing you, the left-hand arrow shows you some cheek that is sort of superimposing the scan, which makes things more difficult uh, for the lab and for the scanner to read what to do. And if the patient doesn't bite into the right position and allow you to record your uh, bite registration correctly digitally, then it's going to be wrong when it reaches your lab. So you still need to check your work is uh, my message to you with these sorts of uh, intraoral scans. It, it doesn't make up for careless dentistry, but it can certainly allow you to pick up your mistakes um, very quickly and correct them. So you will know if you look at your scan here that your bite registration is wrong because the molars are not contacting nor are the premolars and you will take a new bite registration in real time rather than, and that takes 10 seconds rather than uh, sending a, a, the wrong bite registration to the lab and waiting two days for them to receive it, pour it up and then check it and then need to recall your patient to take a new bite registration if the bite is uncertain for your technicians. So. If you get the bite right, you've done a decent scan, is the overall experience as user friendly? And it's my belief that it's actually, by and large, more user friendly because if you're doing multiple units, if you're doing even six anterior veneers and you're worried about, will my light body be starting to set? Can I keep my preps really dry and free of uh, gingival uh, exudate? Then the answer is yes, you can because you can scan very, very quickly for those sorts of uh, clinical cases before you get any uh, sagging or um, loss of retraction of the gingival margins, before you get any ooze or bleeding, 
uh, if you need to redo a certain section, you just cut that out digitally and rescan that section. And the software with all of these scanners will stitch your repaired area into the scan with a high degree of accuracy. So it allows you to not have to redo the whole scan, just to redo one little section. What we do know is that uh, your scanning time, once you've mastered it, will be equivalent to or faster than your conventional impressions. And when you add to that your ability to not have to do a whole variety of either ordering custom trays or getting a variety of different trays, trying them in the mouth, doing all those sorts of things, painting adhesive onto trays, um, you do start to save time. And uh, even in novices, so the study that I've listed there from, uh, from last year shows that even if you're a dental student, uh, you're going to find that it's faster and dental students often struggle. So I think there's certainly a lot of emerging evidence to say that uh, you will uh, not have headaches with this once you master it and you will learn um, that, that way. So if you're having any uh, questions at this point in time, please start typing them in to the chat bar and we'll pick those up and try to address them as we go. I guess the question that follows from that is, well, okay, if, the, if it's quite user-friendly and I can adapt to get this to work in my practice, uh, should I get a mill? And the answer is, it depends. Um, and one of the issues it depends on is, well, are there actual mill crowns or uh, other devices that you make any good? I think most of your chair-side mills really only have good applicability to things like uh, inlays or onlays or single unit crowns. You're not going to be able to use it for complex bridge work easily. You're probably not going to be milling veneers. And, uh, but what we do know is that from not all that many studies that I could find that are recent at least, I've listed the ones that I could find there, that most chair-side mill crowns have a good survival rate. So I'm not here to tell you you have to use a lab and not mill your own crowns because if you have a good mill and you know how to use it, you can get some very good results that have a good survival rate. And it's quite similar to what you might get from some laboratory made crowns. I think the, the real issue with milling relates to uh, the whole issue of how you integrate it into your practice and the sorts of limitations that it poses on the sorts of materials that you can choose. So looking quickly at the considerations for chest side scanning before we go back to the milling. These things on the screen are the sorts of issues that you are going to want to consider with your chest side scanning. Who's going to do the staff training? What's the sort of disinfection you're going to do? Uh, the, the cost things are all sorts of things you're going to have to work out first uh, with your vendor. How are you going to back up your data if it's on a laptop such as CareStream? or uh, your Trios, where does that laptop sit? It, it's a gaming quality laptop with a high output graphics card, usually an NVIDIA 1060 or something uh, similar to that. Um, it's going to need a... If they're portable equipment, how are you going to back them up as well? Um, what's the service contracts with some of these uh, order your parts, what's, what's your internet connection speed because a lot of us have good download speeds and terrible upload speeds and you're uploading files that can be very large sometimes and, and Matt please butt in but some of the files can be 30 or 40 meg, it can be larger than that sometimes can't they? Uh, they can be, most of the time they're roughly around the 40 meg though. Okay. If you're doing a full mouth case or large implant case it can definitely get very large. Yeah. So if you've got lousy upload like what I have in my home um, using uh, one of the Sydney-based uh, internet providers, then uh, it will take a long time to uh, send 40 meg upstream. And while it's being sent uh, upstream, it, it may delay all your other internet access the rest of the practice. So be aware of those sorts of things. Um, there's certainly advantages in having wireless technology with these or system or in a little um, easily portable, others with the laptop uh, tend to be a little bit more difficult because you've got to carry the laptop into a different room, re-plug things in, make sure it's connected to the power and so on and so forth. Uh, some scanners heat up and start up really quickly and the software gets you in in a flash. Others are quite tricky and slow to get up and running. 
and uh, you want one that you can have at your chair side that you can use very easily and use it for your case presentations. And if you're using it on the vast majority of your new patients and for all your crown and bridge work, for instance, then you'll want it really ready to rock and roll all throughout the day if you're running a busy practice. With your milling, as I was alluding to before, some of it relates to, well, how much is it going to cost you to have the full suite? Some of these mills are expensive, they need to be plumbed in, or they need to have uh, you know, consumable parts. The actual uh, milling burrs are quite expensive and need to be adjusted and, and set up uh, and calibrated periodically. Um, you need to keep an inventory of the sorts of colours and types of materials. You don't just want A3 for everything if you have some standards. So you're going to need a variety of shades and uh, types of blocks, both in Emacs and various other composite materials. Um, you're going to probably want to stain and glaze a lot of these crowns and inlays that you make. And do you have a furnace to do that? And who's going to apply the stain and glaze and characterize things? Is it going to be you or are you going to employ one of your staff to do it? And um, so yeah, there, there is that sort of issue that way. You don't easily get access to things like zirconia and layered zirconia, obviously, uh, through your own chair side mill. You can't do your PFMs and you can't do posts and cores, or, nor complex veneers, bridges, those sorts of things with chair side mill very easily. So in cases like that, you are still going to need a lab to back you up in those sorts of areas. So. Uh, you know, I'm not going to touch on dentures because dentures are really a separate kettle of fish and we're not recommending it for scanning at this point in time. It's really your fixed pros and things like the splints and, um, and, and other retainers, but you're not going to mill those in your chair side scan. You know, uh, it, that's my belief anyway. Uh, it's quite nice to have a, a, a mill and a furnace and all those other things so that you can fix things up if the shades are a little bit off or you need to tighten the contact point or you've had to do a big occlusal adjustment, you want to reglaze. So there are advantages in doing that. You could have a furnace and still be sending all your work to a lab if you want to and still be doing those adjustments yourself. One of the risks with doing it yourself, uh, by milling yourself is if you get it wrong, you fix it, um, you can't blame anyone else. And if you get it wrong, your patient's going to blame you. Uh, we do get blamed as a, a group of laboratories by dentists all the time because it's never the dentist's fault. It's always the lab when things don't fit or the shade's wrong. We know that that's not always true though, uh, but the lab's are an easy scapegoat when things go wrong. But when you're making it, you wear the risk and, uh, and be aware of that. But having said that, if you're in a remote area, if you've got patients who travel a long way to come to you and they want the fix done there and then, then uh, you know there's big advantages in having a mill as part of your overall digital strategy. So uh, there's no reason why you can't have a mill and be sending a lot of your other work still to the lab and just mixing and matching to suit the patient and the type of case and doing both. Um, you know, your, your blocks that you're going to use for milling are somewhere around the $20 to $30 mark. And that compares to be quite cheap compared to the sorts of fees that we're going to charge you for uh, any real crown and bridge work or other things that we might make for you from your scans, but you have to factor in your labour costs and what it's taking you in surgery time and what your patient is going to do while you're milling these items. Are they going to be sitting in your chair? Are they going to be in reception? Are they going to come back later in the day? Do you or don't you temporise? They're the sorts of things that you have to uh, evaluate and be across as you're managing this. However, if you want to connect to your laboratory, um, we will certainly take uh, scans from just about all the major brands. You can see the brands there. And provided we can convert them or you can export them through a system that can then allow those files to be open in what we call STL files, which is the uh, tessellation language that uh, our software can then use, we can read them. So I liken it to having a, a, a JPEG or a a raw file that can then be read by just about any computer. So if you're not sure, you can always contact us uh, as a modern dental uh, user and we can tell you will we'll that scan a better output to our system um, easily and, uh, and seamlessly, which then means that it's quicker to turn your job around. I guess to summarise on that point then, 
be aware that scanners will only see what, what we see with conventional impressions and so it's not the panacea for you know, really hard preps that are hard to take impressions on. You're going to still have to do retraction or electrosurgery or some other means of uh, revealing margins if you want good fit. Highly polished surfaces and reflective surfaces will need spray even on the, with the scanners that, don't, uh, that aren't the 3M ones. Uh, because they tend to reflect and give you an inaccurate area of the scan. Same for really highly polished cores. Uh, we need to be aware of that. Uh, we need to still dry teeth, keep them dry. If you have moisture in a scan, it will blur out that part of your preparation and that's what the scan is going to see. You want a scanner that's going to be really easy and quick to use, as I've said many times so far, otherwise you won't use it. I think you want a scanner that gives you as high accuracy as is feasible at that particular price point. And uh, if you do that, then you won't be trading off quality in the sorts of impressions that you take. And in a nutshell, I guess that means buying the best that you can afford within reason that gives you scope to deliver on what you do in your practice now and over the next three to five years. It's probably true to say that in five years' time, you will replace your scanner if you buy it today, the same way that in the next five years you would replace your phone and your laptop. And, uh, and so that's the way technology is changing and you want to look at a three to five year lifespan on these. It's, so you want to adopt at the right time, purchase it, start to use it straight away, get the value for money that you need and write it off so that it's fully depreciated by the time you stop using it and get a new one. So that's my view on it, and you may uh, agree or disagree, but that seems to be the way things are going. At this point in time, uh, we'll move on to, well, let's assume that you see some benefits for uh, going digital uh, in the workflows that you have in your practice as far as your impressions go for generally uh, fixed pros and for uh, Invisalign or other sorts of uh, clear aligners or for uh, certain so sorts of splints or other uh, retainers, then how are you going to really get the best outcomes possible from your chosen scanner? And we're going to spend the next probably 20 slides or so looking at some issues with that. It starts, it's our belief, with a partnership with your lab, unless you're going to mill everything yourself. And if you're going to only be milling, then I think you won't be using your scanner to its full potential. So uh, we can certainly help you with uh, things such as choosing the right scanner to suit your practice, setting up a connection, because you need a secure connection to your lab so that you can upload these files quickly and easily, and that's how we upload them. We can give you virtual wax-ups of the sorts of restorations we're going to do. I'll show you some examples of that shortly and give you feedback as necessary on your preps or your scans uh, very quickly. So provided we've received them and we know that you want feedback on them, it is theoretically possible to call you and communicate with you and say, look, this is enough to scratch. Can you quickly rescan that before you send the patient home? That's a really big advantage for those patients traveling big distances to see you or who take antibody cover or who have um, other issues that uh, basically create difficulty in getting them back for a new impression if something isn't right. Um, we can give you advice on how many teeth to include in the scan and uh, also give you those other sorts of recommendations that you can read on the page. One of the things that you should be aware of if you aren't already is that there are some cost advantages through rebates that can be offered through many labs, including our own, on um, you sending us jobs digitally. So you can save money on certain uh, restorations by sending them digitally to us. And that can work very much in your favour, as well as saving the cost of uh, couriers in getting jobs to us. If you're going to maximise the output that you get from your scanner, then you really want to take it systematically. You want to plan your work then do it well and then review it and ask yourself, where can I actually uh, do it better? How can I improve both in my dentistry and in my scanning so that I maximise the return on my investment and make my life easier? Because I think we often sweat over getting good impressions taken. So that when you're going to plan your case, what I would think that you could be doing uh, with your scan is to do a pre-treatment full mouth scan. And the reason for doing that is because it allows you to look at all the different features of the mouth 
And it's a bit like taking study models. But in this case, it will be study models, potentially in full color, that you can look at at any time, that you don't have to pour up and trim, that you can rotate on your screen in all sorts of 360 degree views and, uh, and have a look at and determine, well, what, what do I really need to do here? And you can show these to the patient and, and ask them for their feedback about what their smile looks like, what they want in any of the treatment that you are proposing for them. You can take a preoperative shade and, and record that quickly using your scanner, at least with some brands of scanners, and um, you can then forward that for a digital smile design or digital wax up. So what these things sort of look like on the screen on the top right, that's from a trios, and it takes shade in a variety of areas if you tell it where to choose the, the shade, and you can see that it's picking up different shades over the tooth surface, and that information can be exported directly to the lab. And uh, provided you've calibrated it properly, it can be quite useful. The lower left-hand ones are that uh, sort of pseudo Invisalign simulation that the ITRO allows you to do very, very quickly within a couple of minutes of uh, processing. And the bottom right-hand image is the sort of uh, full arch upper and lower scan that you can get that really is quite an impressive way of communicating to your patient, certainly better than a lot of intraoral camera um, images that you can provide them. And then you can use these scans as well for monitoring things like tooth wear, showing your patients where they've got bruxofacets, um, where they've got stain in their teeth, um, where they've got recession, various features that can be factored into what you're going to do with your restorative dentistry. You can send that scan to us and we can then do virtual wax ups and create things like proposed designs for veneers so that you can then show the patient a sort of before and after, before you even go down the path of doing any tooth preparation whatsoever, and it takes very little effort on your part. So provided we've received the scan, we can do uh, smile designs this way and show you what things might look like. And then you can say, well, I want to have wide teeth in the premolar area and close some of that buccal corridor. I want rounder incisal edges, whatever the case may be, we can start to then manipulate that so that both you and your patient know what you're getting before you put a burr onto the teeth. So once it comes around to preparing the teeth, then what you're going to do is do a good preparation, obviously, with smooth margins because your scanner is going to show you any irregularities in the margins very easily. You should take a stump shade because all of us at the lab like to know what is the underlying colour of the tooth compared to what is the chosen fibre restoration shade and what's the difference. How do we achieve that difference so that, the say, a dark stump doesn't shine through and give you a grey or blackishy brown hue to your final restoration? So we then choose different opacities of materials in consultation with, the, with you and the images that you've provided us. And these high definition photos are very useful to also give that characterization of the adjacent teeth. You would then ideally do a, a full arch scan, although quadrant scans are quite acceptable for single units and sometimes for a couple of units. Is that right, Matt? Yeah. That's um, full yeah. Arch is ideal. yeah. And we really like the full arch because it gives us the whole idea of what the anatomy is in the contralateral side of the mouth. Um, it, it helps sometimes in planning some of the articulation. Uh, in the way that we can design your um, restorations in function and things like the emergence profile really uh, give us a lot more information that way. And then what you should be doing is uh, you can design the path of insertion with a lot of the scanning software. You should be looking at your margins and looking for undercuts. It will show you areas that are deficient in your scan, um, areas where contact points might not be well recorded, and you can use clearance tools so you're going to be scanning with something like an Optrigate or something of the equivalent in the mouth to keep all the soft tissues out of the way, to keep the field dry. And what you can do with your scanning, as you can either say this is a three-shape example, not all scanners allow you to do this, but you can either scan the whole arch for argument's sake and then cut out the area where you've still got the cord around the tooth digitally by using a little digitally razor and you just basically rub that area out. Then you will rescan the margins of your preparation or preparations uh, before the tissue, soft tissue collapses or bleeds. And that's all you have to then do. So the 
you know, 98 percent of your scan has already been done, your scanner will pick up uh, the area that you're scanning, provided you start scanning on one of the adjacent teeth in your scan, will pick up your new margins there and stitch it all in very nicely. So that's your sort of uh, that's one scan strategy where um, you can either scan it immediately by removing the cord and then lock the that margin before you scan the rest of the arch, which is this one, or you can do what I was describing where you scan the arch and then remove the cord last and do it that way. Having that sort of flexibility in your software is a big advantage when you've got patients with difficult to manage soft tissues. So you want a scanner really that can allow you to do that and um, not all of them do. Certainly the TRIOS does. I'm not here to advocate one particular brand of scanner, but that is one feature of the TRIOS that is seen to be quite a, a useful um, tool. And uh, it allows you to also, if you've had a poor retraction, you need to re-retract for some reason, you can pop a little bit of extra cord in, cut that section out, and then just re-scan that area again. We do a bit of electrosurgery that way. So very easy and user-friendly that way to get right. You get clearance tools that show you by colour how much clearance there is between teeth. Obviously, this is uh, some teeth in occlusion posteriorly, but it's showing that uh, there's that green amount of occlusion between that um, the, the two one and the opposing tooth and uh, and it allows you to know very quickly have i got enough clearance will this be enough for my chosen material you need to know what the, that clearance is for your chosen material it's a really nice feature to have um, and if it's not then trim a little bit off either the opposing tooth or your preparation stitch in that uh, change and everything is right before you then submit that scan through to the lab. And that's what you need to do first. So you're going to be checking all of that and reviewing it, adjusting your preparation if need be. If you want to mark the margins of your preparation, you can. There's margin marking tools in all the scanners. But if not, you just send your scan to the lab and they will mark the margins of your preparation. If you want to debate where the margin needs to be, then you can ask the lab to send screenshots of the mark margins to you for your approval. Otherwise, you can trust your technician to do that. But we do get cases Quite often with the uh, coming to lab where we get people who say, you know, I want my margin to finish exactly at this particular point and they need to mark it either on a poured up model or they need to mark it if they're sending us a scan so that we know where they want it to be. Otherwise, we may very well interpret some margins differently to what they will. And once you've marked all that, you've got all the shade details, material choice and so on in there, you've checked all the clues or clearance, then you can send it to us and the software in the scanners tends to then process that image to get it into a high definition file, which then later on compressed and sent through to uh, the lab. And then the lab will open that and have a look. So the lab will get your scan, and this is just a case, actually one of mine, where uh, Peter Newman here at the Sydney lab was designing some veneers for me. And we were just looking at what the veneers needed to be lengthwise, um, what the relative size of the laterals to the centrals needed to be, how the canines were going to show, and he would mark some of the margins and then ask me, is that where I wanted the margin to be, and so on. And then we can debate this. And this is what your technician can do. So not only can they do virtual designs for you before you do the preparation, but once they receive your uh, scans, they can then have a look and say, finish want the centrals, where, if you're closing a diastema, how do you want the space to be accorded between the teeth, particularly if they're of an uneven size or shape. So these are all things that are very handy to um, be able to have control over and sending us scans allows us to receive this information quickly and start designing and uh, communicating with you to give you what it is that you want. So you may very well get a proposed design back from us if that's what you want and then review that and communicate with us. Once you receive the job back, once it's finished, you can then have a look at that. If you really want to, you can scan that job. Uh, if you get a 3D printed model, because that's what we will normally do from your scan, except for single unit cases. Uh, for anything complex that requires porcelain to be added by hand, it's part of hand finishing. And for virtually all veneers, you're going to get some sort of uh, printed model so that you can see, examine the fit on the model and, uh, and so that we can also finish the margins to fit nicely right to where they need to be. And you really want to ask yourself as part of your continuous improvement cycle, 
what do I need to do better so that this works even better next time? And you can use your scanner to photograph the, the cases that you're really proud of. The sorts of things that you might want to improve uh, how you're doing the scan pathway so that you become very efficient at scanning. How are you going to overcome voids because all scanners find it hard to read certain areas, particularly in the proximal areas. And some scanners read them better than others. Where teeth overlap, and it's hard, they, a lot of scanners find it hard to read those areas of overlap. You're going to look at your margins and say, what am I going to do to get smooth margins that don't have ledges and, and rough areas? And how do I keep my margins visible for scanning wherever possible? How much uh, reduction in the margin needs to be there in order to not have them too subgingival? And how do I get my scan speed to be faster? So I'm going to give you a few tips on that shortly. A lot of scanners will require you, first of all, to have a scanning pathway that starts usually on a posterior tooth, a, a molar tooth, and you'll start on the occlusal surface and work forwards. And that's smart because you're starting an area that you've just dried before it can get wet with saliva again. But it also tends to allow the software to orientate itself so it knows where it is in the mouth. And, once, and it will ask you whether you're doing an upper arch or a lower arch. And then you'll start scanning and you'll follow those lines as you can see there. I'm not going to read that all out to you. Um, often a lot of the scanners require you to scan the lingual or the palatal surface next after you've done the occlusal and then you finish with the, the, the buccal or labial surfaces. It doesn't always have to be like that and it is flexible in how you do it but scanners like a particular pathway and the preferred pathways tend to be articulated well by their manufacturers. So you need to be willing to experiment with their technique before you start to really change it to suit your own. And you'll specify which teeth are part of the restoration, the planned restoration, so the scanner knows as well uh, as you're sending that through. Here are some tips, I suppose, for what, what can you do to uh, get clinical success with a scanner. The first one starts with getting the right scanner, buying a really cheap one because it's cheap, but if it's not user-friendly, you're not going to use it, as I said to you many times. You should practice on your staff. That's what you, you pay them to be your guinea pigs at times. You don't want to do a complex case, uh, you know, that's multiple units with your scanner the first time around and expect to do it fast because you, you're not going to. You're going to need some time to learn how it works. And it will take you, I would think, a few hours of fiddling around to really get start to feel comfortable. And there's lots of these nice tools that uh, you can see on the screen that allow you to do some really interesting uh, work with your case. But unless you're familiar with what they are, you won't use them. So have a go and learn how the software works, preferably on a, not on so much on a model, but on a, in a real mouth, because <coughs> every vendor will have sales reps that show you that it's dead easy to scan the model in your hand and you rotate it around. And I'd say, well, that's the same as prepping a tooth on a Columbia dental form when you're in dental school. You don't have cheeks, tongue, saliva, um, anesthesia, pulps, all sorts of other things to worry about. You've just got a tooth. We all found hard to, to cut the first time we did it. But, you know, scanning a model is a bit like that when you see that from a rep, and it's never like that in the mouth. So you really need to practice on a, a real-life human being and, and start using some of those tools and see how they make a difference to your practice. You've got to have decent internet and IT set up. You need to know how computers connect to your network, have the passwords available, have your trusted connection set up with your lab. Uh, you need to have enough stock of the scanner tips and have your staff knowing not to throw them away um, unless they are disposable. And uh, you need to know how to calibrate your machine and all those sorts of things. And then have it set up in a good area of your practice where you can easily access it but not trip over any cords or have things damaged in any way or have things stolen. And once you've done that, you may even want to consider taking a conventional impression and taking a scan and sending them both to lab and letting them choose the best one and give you some feedback on what you're doing well or not so well in each because we're happy to give you feedback, not in a super critical way, we want you to get it right because that means we can get it right for you as well and it just saves aggravation all around. We both win that way. Um, you know, you, you want to be starting to scan your new patients and starting to implement this as part of your traditional way of doing a workflow and in a sense doing an electronic charting of your new patients.
because that will really make a difference to the sorts of things that and confidence levels that you have with your uh, devices that way. Um, I've talked a bit about that feedback there and keeping enough stock of things, particularly the Optrigates are very helpful when you're scanning and they're not super expensive, but you need some small ones and some medium or large ones. And I guess I'm really emphasizing here when I say avoid shortcuts, you know, you can do a quadrant scan or just scan one or two teeth either side of your prep and we can work with that, but try to uh, get it right if you can, try to dry things off well, have good retraction, um, get your staff involved. It's, it's hard to keep things out of the way while you're scanning sometimes with difficult patients. So you, you need good staff who can help you with that and don't expect immediate success that way. Make sure you're calibrating your scanner on a regular basis because some of them go out of whack and if they're not reading both colour and size well then you may get an inaccurate scan. There are software updates and sort of firmware updates that um, help with your scanning and you need to be connected regularly to check for those. They'll often notify you of, of new software updates. You should back up all your files and be aware also that after a month with some softwares, they tend to uh, compress them on the hard drives of your computer to save space because of the file size. So if you do a scan but you're going to sit on it for a while before sending it to the lab, you may actually, with certain software, it's my belief, my understanding that you may have to rescan it if you uh, leave them on your, your computer for more than a month. That's fine to look at at a later date. It will still display well uh, in your case presentations, but it, it won't have enough usable data for some of our lab software to work as well as what it should. Is that correct, Matt, from your understanding? Uh, on a select few scanners, that is the, the issue with it. Uh, if you are going to sort of reuse them, it's, it's ideal to export it um, if you know that you will reuse it in the future. Yeah, so you much rather export the, the original file and have the lab sit on that and have it saved than leave it on your hard drive and your computer and wait. You'd rather export the file and say, can you please hold this job at the lab until I know the pulp status of this particular tooth or whatever, rather than, than waiting a month and sending it to us. Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, as I keep emphasising, it's not going to make you the world's best dentist if you don't know how to retract or keep teeth dry, unfortunately. But it, if you're a good dentist, it will really show impressive results to your patient. It's really going to instill a lot of confidence in them and they're going to be blown away at the sort of work that you are doing for them and they're going to really like it. And the anecdotal feedback we get from uh, uh, quite a number of customers is that once they start using scanners, a lot of their patients actually find the whole crown and bridge experience or even uh, splint impression experience so uh, relatively pleasant compared to what they were expecting that they're much more amenable to other work if and when it needs to arise. And so you've got more cooperative, more compliant patients as a result who are not psyched out of uh, having dentistry done when they know that it's actually good for them. Um, by all means, use the tools to check what you're sending us because your scanner software is really going to tell you whether the scan is good enough or not. It's going to show you parts that are missing by showing it's a different color in the scan. It's going to do a whole lot of things which we don't have time to show you all that detail here tonight. But if you don't use those tools, you're going to miss out on a lot of valuable uh, learning opportunities. So make the most of it. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. And as we start to wrap up then, just a couple of quick tips, which is to say that if you're finding, as you start to use a scanner, that um, you know the access is somewhat difficult, then you really need to be sure that using the smaller scanner that you've got, because some of them with the big heads that we looked at earlier uh, are very difficult to use in people with limited buckle clearance. Um, you might want to use some extra LA or nitrous to try to relax the patient. Uh, because if they know they're not going to have pain, they do tend to relax. And certainly with nitrous, soft tissue relaxation is, is very common in those cases. You might then get better access that way. Um, be aware of your learning curve. It's, it's, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, surgical extractions, it took me a while to have confidence in, use, in, in doing them, uh, doing crown and bridge generally, doing full upper denture impressions, whatever it is in dentistry. You're not brilliant at it first time round. This is a new technique that you would need to uh, learn, but you'll get better at dealing with access as you gain experience. And uh, you'll, you'll know how to get around those difficult to reach areas. Uh, by all means, to get the optimum results from uh, the aesthetics of restorations, give us photographs of what you want, because then we can reproduce that 
uh, in the finished restoration, use the HD photo function where it's available in, in your scanner. Um, and as I said, certainly uh, some of them have that and some don't. Uh, Three Shape have it, I believe Itero may have it, um, and CareStream is quite good for a lot of these too. Um, take the stump shade, even if you don't have a scanner, may I suggest that if you don't automatically take stump shades for any uh, relatively translucent restorations in the appearance zone, then please do so. It really helps the technicians to provide you with a good shade match wherever possible, um, as we talked about earlier. If you're worried about bite shift, then uh, you know, take the scan, check the bite, check it again in the mouth, so look at the screen, look in the mouth, see what's going on. And when the patients are numb, sometimes they don't know where they're biting. You might need to guide them into the right position uh, in order to get a reproducible bite that is uh, the way it should be. Um, if you are experiencing problems with the occlusion on jobs that you receive back from the lab with, from your scanner, then uh, consider that maybe your bite registration isn't comprehensive enough. So if you're only sending quadrant scans, send a full up scan and see if that uh, works well and see if you're providing enough clearance. Uh, it's a general rule of thumb that for anything that we make in uh, CAD CAM, we'd like a millimetre of clearance as a minimum. Otherwise, it starts to get a bit tight. We can mill down to 0.4 or 0.5 in theory with some zirconia materials, but it's not going to be as strong as if it was uh, thicker that way. It's more liable to, to crack as you're trying to uh, fit it into the mouth and do a trying. So where possible, give us enough room so that we can provide you with enough thickness of material for a long-lasting result that also looks good in the patient's mouth and gives you a little bit of wriggle room if you need to do a little bit of adjustment. So use the clearance tool and see whether, where you've got clearance all over your prep. It will tell you in different colours and numerical values as need be what clearance you've got, which is really brilliant to know. I've got one and a half millimetres here. I can do pretty much anything I like. Certainly had a really strong uh, result with Emacs with that sort of clearance that way. If you're getting overhangs or incomplete margins, then you know, try to keep your margins as uh, equigingival or supragingival as you can. Two core technique is really critical. Um, you know, th that will allow you to leave one cord in the sulcus while you remove the bigger cord. That's going to keep your retraction happening. I always say this at any other uh, seminars I run because it was taught to me by a prosthodontist colleague that when you put your cords in, if you can't see all the cord, then you're not going to be able to see the sulcus later on in the margin. So you need to be able to see the cord sitting in the sulcus. If you can't see the cord, you either need another cord or you need a fatter cord in there. And if that's not resolving it, then you need to do some soft tissue recontouring with a laser or electrosurgery if that's appropriate. Um, or you need to somehow get the gingival health to improve. But uh, the one clinical tip that you must always adhere to is see the cord. If you see the cord, you're probably going to have a really good result. Um, consider locking the margins if your scanner allows you to do that. And, uh, and mark your margins if you're worried about whether your technician can read them. Have a can of scan spray, no matter what scanner you use, just for those difficult scans where you're finding the scanner's not actually picking up the detail that you want. Make sure your scanner is calibrated. And if you've got any doubts about the scanner shade uh, taking ability, then send us some other HD photos with your uh, shade guide tabs uh, level with the incisal or edges of the teeth so that we can see what the colors are and remove any strong lipstick or other items that can influence the, the reflected light that goes into the scan. Keep your scans as small as you can because if you scan lots and lots of soft tissue and all the soft and hard palette when we don't need to see that, that's just going to keep the file really big um, and we don't need that information for the vast majority of uh, items that we're making you. And that's going to take longer to for your computer to process before it can upload it to us. It's going to take longer to send it to us and it's just more fiddling around. So the idea is to provide all the relevant information and nothing more. So the rule of thumb I say is what would your custom tray include in your impression? That's what you need for your scan. So consider that. And uh, the nice thing is you're not going to be paying for a custom tray if you're using an intraoral scanner. So in, in essence then, they're the sorts of tips that we can offer you. And in summary, 
I think it's true to say that an intraoral scanner can really transform a lot of your life in dentistry if you do a moderate amount of crown and bridge work, splints, ortho, those sorts of things, implants. It can really make a difference to what you're doing if you allow it to and if you start to learn the technology. I liken it somewhat to our smartphones. Most of us would, wouldn't be without it when we travel or when we're on the road. And I think once you learn to adopt this technology, you won't really look back. But you do need to be aware that as with all technology, there is a learning curve and we can help you and support you during that learning curve and as you grow to master what it is that you're doing with your scanner. So by all means, contact us please and ask us. People like Matt are experts with digital. They deal with all aspects of this day in and day out. They, they're here to help you and that's part of the service that we provide you. We're not here just to make your restoration. We're here to help you achieve clinical success. That's our commitment to you. So I hope that you um, embark on that journey with us when the time comes for you to um, adopt the technology because it's there ready for you. So uh, let's consider how we can do it. Are there any questions at all? No. no. And Matt, any comments that you'd like to make? Uh, no, I think you pretty much covered everything there, Simon, for the for the basics of digital. Um, but if there are any questions, there's, you know, feel free to ask them now or, or come back to us later and, and we can answer them at a later stage. I'm just waiting to see if we receive any typed in uh, questions now. Um, just with regards to the certificates um, for the CPD points, I'll be posting those out to all attendees tomorrow. Okay, so, um, or if you do have any questions that come up at a later date, you can email me at L Sullivan, that's L S U W -L, L I V A N, at moderndentalpacific.com. Uh, my details are also on the, um, the flyer that went out to everyone regarding tonight. Okay. Well, in the absence of any questions, I thank you very much for your participation in tonight's webinar and uh, wish you well and hope to touch base with you sometime in the future. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. Good night. Thank you. Bye.